Welcome to our new show, the What Anyone Can Do podcast with Leo Batari and me, Randy Cantrell. Our new show picks up where the last show, Year of the Peer, left off, highlighting the simple truth that who you surround yourself with matters, and that if we enlist the support of others, give back to those who give to us, and pay it forward for the next generation, we can do anything. Author and keynote speaker Leo Batari and I will interview a diverse group of thought leaders who will share stories and insights that will help you succeed in business and in life. How? By doing the things anyone can do, but most of us never will. You know him, you love him. He is Scott Monty, an internationally recognized Fortune 10 leader whose background in classics positioned him to see through the shiny objects and drill down to understand the common human needs that drive us all. Scott speaks to and advises businesses and groups on how to move at the speed of customers online. Scott spent six years as an executive at Ford Motor Company as a strategic advisor on crisis communications, influencer relations, marketing, customer service, innovative product launches, and more. He also has another decade and a half of experience in communications and marketing agencies. Scott Money writes about the changing landscape of business, technology, communications, marketing, and leadership at scottmonte.com. He produces a widely acclaimed weekly newsletter and the podcast, The Full Monty. We welcome Scott Monty to the show. Scott Monty, welcome to what anyone can do. I can't tell you how pleased we are to have you here on the show. Uh, if there's anyone who understands uh, the whole concept of who you surround yourself with matters and community and building community, it's you. So we're so pleased to have you on the program. Well, thank you very much, Leo. And uh, it's great to be surrounded by you guys today. There we go. Hey, one of the things that... Um, and now we chatted just before uh, we got started here, was I had mentioned to you that I've been conducting a lot of uh, workshops over the past, um, you know, 12 to 18 months and talking about the fact that it's, I think, we're at a point in time where the people who surround us maybe uh, matter to us more than ever, particularly when we have declining trust in institutions and we look to one another for advice and counsel, even people we may not even know, right? People, but we, people who we perceive are like us, who may have read the same book that interests us or driven the same car or, you know, want to send our kids to college. We look to these people um, and take that as a powerful data point um, for how we behave and how we act. But I think when we look at kind of the evolution of how we've engaged others from the standpoint of listening to what the company tells us about their product and service to wanting corroborating evidence from like the New York Times or Consumer Reports to now wanting advice from people like us because that's uh, in many respects, uh, those are the people we trust. I'd uh, just love to get some of your uh, thoughts on that and get us started today. Yeah, well, I think uh, it, it's certainly uh, very appropriate to bring that up uh, in, in today's day and age because, I mean, uh, th there seems to be an extreme lack of, of distrust of so many different sources right now, um, whether it's the media, whether it's companies, whether it's even individuals that you happen to uh, come across, either online or in person. And, and I think the more assurance we can give people, you know, the more resources that we can give them. Uh, and, and that means putting ourselves out there in more places and participating more um, from a variety of uh, perspectives. Um, we give them the ability to go out and, and fact check themselves or, or to, to, to double check with a source that they trust, not that we're telling them they have to trust. Um, that becomes uh, of, of the primary importance at this point. And, and ultimately, it, it's not about, um, oh, geez, I, I, uh, I, I wrote about this recently. What did I call it? It's not about shareholder activism. It's about stakeholder activism. You know, we have so many different stakeholders uh, within our organizations, whether it's employees or customers or suppliers or on and on and on. Uh, and, and yet in the news, we hear about shareholder activists that can take over a board. 
Well, really, it can be it can be a group of people with pitchforks and torches on Twitter that ends up taking over your business. If you're not actively giving them the information that they can trust, that they can double check, that they can they can discuss with their own community, um, you know, it 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 really becomes uh, giving people a range of options so they can decide for themselves. It's interesting though, because even with that people tend to choose their own truth. You know, we know that we can turn on the TV today and we can, you know, watch whatever channel we believe aligns with our worldview, where the ad hominem attack has become so commonplace now that it no longer becomes a conversation about ideas and people listening to one another. It becomes attack on the individuals expressing them or the companies expressing them. How are we going to get past that? It's, I think it's a, it's a really good and tough question. And it's one that the, I think that the media landscape makes even more difficult because when we were growing up and, and I'll, I'll lump us in as, as peers sure. here, uh, <laughs> there were three networks right. on television and that was it. And, and, and maybe two papers in our, in our hometown, a morning and an evening paper. And, and that's where you got your information from. And now, I'm, I, with television alone, you know, the, with the explosion of channels, with, with uh, you know, the, the cord cutting going on, I mean, it, there's people that are just being driven down into their own bunkers, uh, if you will, uh, sticking with the information and the, the, the networks that matter to them. And the same thing is happening online. You know, you're seeing people just moving toward people that are like them, which you know, that's human nature. Of course, you sure. want to be people that like you. But what that does, is it creates a filter bubble where you don't see the reality outside of your own bubble. Um, and, and that is inherently dangerous. And, and I think the only way past that is to, is to, at least from a brand perspective, insert ourselves in more conversations, do things less about the, um, you know, the, the, the way social and digital has become a broadcast mechanism for brands, a, a, a reach tool, and use it as more of a community platform, which is really what these started out as when you think about it. You know, back when I was at Ford, part of the magic behind what happened is I got out there and I commented on discussion forums and blogs and on Twitter and on Facebook and wherever else the conversation took us. And it was about putting yourself in those communities where you might not be welcome sometimes. Yeah. But guess what? It was, it was an outside perspective that forced conversation. And through conversation, if done in a civil manner, you can actually achieve better understanding. Well, I think engaging that conversation in the way you did it was very powerful because you know the conversations are going to take place with or without you. So you might as well be in there <laughs> you know, <laughs> weighing in, right? Um, I think the other uh, dynamic, though, that you bring up kind of reaching back to the days where there were, you know, basically three networks. Um, it was, and, and just a few uh, newspapers uh, really in our local area that we paid attention to was also the difference between what was clearly news and clearly editorial, right? So your newspaper was pretty clear on news, sports, weather, obituaries, comics, and the editorial page, right? Pretty much covers it, right? And then on, on TV, you'd have that rare occasion where the general manager of the station may get on in the last two or three minutes. And it was, you know, flashed across the stream in bold, you know, that this is a commentary and this is not about news. Today, of course, that is all blurred um, for the, the average viewer, listener, um, you know, they turn on the television and there is no clear distinction between what is news and what is opinion, what's commentary, which I would imagine just clouds things to, an, on a, to another level. Yeah, I mean, it, it absolutely does. I mean, it's even to the point where um, you, you see some links from, uh, I guess, the Borowitz report on, in a New Yorker that people don't realize that that's satire. Um, you know, so, so it's, you know, between real news, fake news, editorial, I mean, it's all getting swirled in together. And, and people just seem to be shouting from the rooftops at this point. And, and not taking the time 
<clears throat> excuse me, not taking the time to truly understand each other. You know, we spend so much time waiting for a gap in conversation to reply rather than truly absorbing information, processing it, waiting, and then replying with something that, that is contextually relevant, that's responsive, that actually meets the other person's need, not just our own. And I think we've really lost that art of conversation in the process. Yeah, I know um, Randy's got a bunch of questions for you, too. I, I just have one more because you kind of prompted a, a thought that I had just regarding, you know, for me, I guess it's been really tough to watch the media be so accepting of being called fake news, you know? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure they've really pushed back very hard on that. It's almost like they have, you know, by their own, you know, inability or passivity or whatever to directly address this in a way that has any power to it. I feel like this, this notion of fake news has kind of won over a lot of the main people's perception of mainstream media in a way that um, I'm, I'm not sure they didn't give up that ground a little too easily. What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can see what, what you're saying there. Um, you know, I, I think it, it, it could have been helpful for them to do that. I know CNN took, a, took a, an advertising-based approach uh, where they, they have a, an apple and a banana or something, and they, they tell you which fruit it is, um, <laughs> which, great, it's clever advertising, but, you know, the day-to-day -day reporters uh, are the ones that need to be speaking out if they, in fact, feel like they're the ones that are being damaged. Um, I think overall it's done much more harm than good to society because many people are buying into this line now that, um, that, that, that fake news is simply uh, what someone deems it rather than being something that is actually fact-checked and proven to be false. Um, you know, just because you like, don't like something doesn't mean that it's fake. And that, that in turn, you know, cascades down, not just with the media, but with how people interact with brands. Just because a brand does something that you don't like doesn't mean necessarily that they're wrong. It doesn't mean that, um, you know, they've got a bad product. It, it, it's just a difference of opinion. And, and people have lost the ability to, to discuss and, and, and to process opinion, uh, you know, just as we were saying before, versus fact. Um, you know, is it editorial? Is it, is it fact? Um, this is going to take a long and enduring national dialogue about how to discern truth from fiction and, and how to apply that in the media. And the media has to do an incredibly hard job to clean up their own act because there are times when, uh, you know, they're offering opinion where they shouldn't be. And, and that's clouding things as well. So, you know, this is this is not nearly over, and it's it's really just begun. We we've got, I think, finally to just quite a, a conflict too. I think in many respects between. I think we're at a point in time where we've never it's never been more important that we rely on one another, and yet at the same time we find it so difficult to engage in constructive dialogue, <laughs> and that is that is that is pretty tough. It is. It is. There's, there's actually a, um, it's, it's just started out, but it's a small movement uh, right now. My friend Harry Cohen is starting. Harry's a, a leadership coach and a, a trained psychologist. And he has been going on this speaking tour talking about um, uh, heliotropic leadership. And helio, of course, helios is the Greek word for sun. Uh, and there's more energy from the sun than there is from, you know, like salt in the earth. And he started a, a site called be the sun, not the salt dot com. And it's all about being kind and having a positive outlook and doing things to lift people up, not tear them down. And I think it just it comes at the perfect point in society right now where we need to hear more messages like that. I mean, like the Mr. Rogers movie that everyone's talking about this summer. It's the same kind of thing. Uh, there, there was a time in every uh, child's life, if you grew up in the 70s or 80s, where you probably thought 
Mr. Rogers was a cornball. You, you, you probably thought it, he was too simplistic and, and you didn't like it in between the flashy electric company and, and Sesame Street. Um, but as a father, I know over time, I've grown to appreciate Fred Rogers' approach to life and, and the simple messages and the kindness mm -hmm. that he teaches. And, and the movie doing so well at the, the box office, even though it's a documentary, seeing people you know, yearning for that, uh, back to the simpler times, back to uh, focusing on kindness over uh, caustic uh, behavior, I think we need more of that, and I think that's going to be what's going to pull us through. Absolutely. Scott, we've, we've never, at least in my life, I'll qualify it, in my life, I don't know that we've ever seen such widespread and mass, mass comm, which obviously now includes all this digital content, the preaching and the advocacy for tolerance, and yet practiced it so little. The congruency or the incongruency of that. I mean, what's your what's your cultural take on that? Um, <laughs> I, I I don't know if there is one. I mean, it's um, it it it's. I mean, it's the definition of irony, really, right there. Um, and and it's almost like it's a stalemate, you know, like 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 a uh, the old. Uh, Mexican standoff. Somebody's waiting for the other one to blink or to make the first move. Uh, and, and, and it seems to me that the prevailing attitude is that if, if, you, if you make the move toward kindness, toward more understanding, toward giving the other person the benefit of the doubt, that that is seen as a weakness. And I think that's what's preventing a lot of people from taking that first step, to, from feeling like they've lost an argument. You know, there, there's that old New Yorker cartoon uh, where there's a woman coming from the bedroom and her husband's hunched over the computer at a desk. And he said, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll be to bed soon. There's someone wrong on the internet right now. Uh, there will always be someone wrong on the internet. There will always be someone wrong somewhere. But that's not the point. The point is to find common ground. The point is to find things that we can agree on uh, even if we know we're coming from two diametrically opposed viewpoints. Uh, and, and I think it takes great courage for someone to stand up and say, hey, you know what? You may be right. Or I never thought of it that way. Or thank you for helping me understand where you're coming from. We don't see enough of that. And I think when somebody actually takes that step, it just it brings the, the temperature level down so much that suddenly people go, oh, you're just like me. You're another human being on the other end of this screen, on the on the other end of this keyboard, and there's something we can accomplish together. I was part of the generation I entered journalism school uh, at the really at the conclusion of the Watergate fiasco, uh, and prior to that, my perspective of the world was that my parents, grandparents, they trusted the government. Watergate changed that. In, in a pretty magnificent way and made us skeptical. And so you talk historically of those three networks and a couple of newspapers and we trusted, we trusted those, those sources. And today with anybody with a microphone, we, we can podcast, which you do, we do. Um, and there is a, as Seth Godin says, there's, there's no permission required anymore. And so the rigor that we may have thought once took place, with traditional media and now may not take place coupled with the fact that we by and large are headline readers living in a clickbait kind of a world. Are you optimistic that because there is no permission required and we see every day, we see some leader, some corporate Titan or someone in power and authority get taken down with, with some poor behavior that might could have easily, when I was young, easily been hidden. And now it can't. Well, I think the, the journey you described, Randy, of there being distrust in the government after Watergate, I think we're at another inflection point now where, you know, we've already seen so much distrust sown in the media 
And, and, and you think, you know, to Leo's earlier point about the Edelman trust barometer, the government and the media are two of the big areas that are measured in the trust barometer. Uh, I, I know uh, corporations and NGOs are the other two categories that are typically looked at. So that leaves us with where, where do we actually place our trust? Um, if, if not in the government, if not in the media, if not dependably in each other, what have we got left? Corporations, they've got a long way to go right now because they've been seen as, uh, as, as entities that have not been worthy of our trust in the past. And I know there are a lot of brands, and we've seen a trend in brands taking stands uh, where brands are you know, putting their foot down with regard to social issues or political issues or religious issues or whatever they may happen to be, gender issues, um, and, and saying, this is, this is not acceptable. This is what we stand for. At the risk of alienating customers, right? So are we ever going to be able to put our trust firmly within companies? Probably not because there's no consistency there you know, your mileage will vary as we used to say in the auto industry. Um, and that leaves us with NGOs, you know, uh, uh, the, the nonprofits, uh, which, you know, by their very nature should be the great salvation of mankind. Um, they haven't necessarily, again, been consistent or, uh, you know, top of, top of the mind in owning some of these things. And maybe it's time for them to step up. Talk to us a little bit, if you would, just you personally, I'm taken with, with your tagline of finding the humanity between digital and analog of customer experience, but let's talk about our own humanity. And we've, we've often asked our guests, and these are some of the most compelling stories that, that people have shared with us. So as you started out and go back, however far you choose to the, the people that, that you put your trust in, the people that you intentionally, purposefully, or even inadvertently found yourself surrounded by who made an impact on you and kind of set the course and your life would have been drastically different had they not surrounded you? Well, I, first and foremost, uh, I would say my parents uh, who were incredibly supportive of me no matter what direction I wanted to take. They, they made uh, so many sacrifices for me and made it possible for me to do uh, even what I'm doing today, um, they filled me with the confidence that, you know, I, I had um, certainly financial backing, but more importantly, the moral support of them uh, and their, their confidence in me. Um, interestingly enough, um, a lot of the folks that I've surrounded myself with in my career have been typically a generation older um, and I don't necessarily know why that is. I've just kind of, maybe I'm an old soul internally. You know, I think I would have, I would have uh, I would have done pretty well in the 1930s, uh, for some reason. Um, and which is, you know, part of the reason that, you know, my life has this dichotomy to it that, yeah, I'm online all the time, but I have a fountain pen collection and I appreciate receiving and writing handwritten notes. Uh, I, I just think there's a, there's a human touch there. And this, this kind of old soul within me, I think, has gravitated towards some of those, uh, those older uh, folks in my life uh, that have been well-established, that have been able to share their, uh, their life lessons along the way. Um, I'll never forget Andy Ferrara, who uh, was the CEO at uh, Boston Healthcare Associates uh, years ago. Uh, he gave me one of the best bits of advice I can remember. He said, look, stop telling yourself that you, you, you need to achieve more. Or you need to get yourself to a certain position. Just tell yourself, I have arrived, right? Because once you accept that, once you accept that you're in a position where you're an authority or you have influence, you will start acting accordingly rather than trying to constantly act like you're trying to get to the next level. Mm. Simply have that confidence and have that ability to know that you matter where you are and that you're making an impact to the people around you. 
And, and I'll never forget that. Do you suppose that some of the venom that we may see, especially online, may stem from people who didn't have that, who didn't have the advantages that you have? I mean, I'm not a psychologist and, and none of us are, but it's, it, it's interesting. People get behind the keyboard of their phone or their laptop or device and that lack can often come shining through loud and clear. Yeah. Um, I think there's something missing uh, and, and I don't know exactly what it is, whether it was uh, in, in, in upbringing or in present day. Uh, but those people seem to be searching for something. You know? What was it about communication particularly that, that kind of struck your fancy? Because that's, that's really where you've spent your, your life's work by and large. I, I, I backed into it completely by accident. Um, you know, as an undergraduate, I was, uh, I was a humanities uh, guy. I was a classics major. And there was one course I took uh, when I was at Boston University where I cross-registered to the College of Communication from the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, and, and the course was oral presentation. And um, I, I just, I knew from that moment that I, I needed to be speaking with people. I needed to be either up in front of people or, you know, interacting with them in some meaningful way. Um, and, and truly, I didn't have my first official communications job until I got to Ford Motor Company. I was working in sales and marketing roles previously. But I just knew when I got to Ford that that's where I belonged, in, in a communications kind of setting, helping executives understand things, helping customers understand things, um, and, and, you know, really trying to, um, trying to bridge the gap trying to bridge that divide that I saw more and more. Leo. Yeah. I, you know, what, what is, what struck me and I think um, is, is really helpful to, to think about is this idea of as a society trying to do more to seek common ground and to uh, act with kindness and all. And I do worry a little bit that the lessons that we're taught, the lessons our kids are taught every time, they look at any kind of media is that compromise is never celebrated. It's, it's not about common ground. It's about who won, who lost, who caved, you know, who, who are the victors. Never is it celebrated where people come together who may in fact want to do something that's good for the country or do good for their community. And instead of the compromise being celebrated, it becomes one that is often, um, uh, you know, poked at and picked at and ridiculed even to a certain degree. And I, I think it's going to take people with really great courage um, to rise above that um, and, and really try to do what's right um, for their communities and for their states and, and the country in order for uh, things to improve in that regard. And they're going to have to. I think we are all in the same boat here. Um, and still we realize that you know, and still we tar start colonizing Mars. This is, <laughs> this is our planet. And this is where we all have to live together and exist together and hopefully do so in a way where, um, um, you know, we can kind of peacefully coexist. So. Well, well, we'll find a way to argue on Mars if we get there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I think <clears throat> your point, Leo, where it's uh it's, it's a we versus they attitude. Um, it's become so deeply ingrained. And, and I think part of the responsibility there lies, again, at the feet of the media who cover politics like they cover sports. Yes. Right? There's a winner, there's a loser. And when you're, when you're associated with a losing side, that doesn't feel that great, you know? And, and then, you know, that like the classic uh, Boston Red Sox, New York Yankees rivalry, um, it's just about how much the other team sucks. Um, you know, and, and I've been at Fenway park where people are chanting Yankees suck and we're not playing the Yankees. <laughs> you know, I mean, right. it, it's become that ingrained Yeah, and, and I'm afraid that as a society that we're, we're taking sides against each other when there's so much more common ground. I, and I think there's a, there's a, there's kind of this false patina over, uh, the divisiveness between people that, that the online world is contributing to 
But when you sit down with somebody, you know, we, we talked about uh, earlier in the program about how people are braver uh, behind the keyboard to say things they wouldn't say in person. Because when you do sit down uh, and in person, there is that common ground. And to your point, it's not celebrated. It's not showcased. It's not shown in any specific or appreciable manner by the media. Well, I think to your point too, when, when people are sitting down in front of one another and that allows us to become in touch with someone's humanity, they're no longer just a name or a job title. They're actually a human being who may have kids or a dog or the share the same, the favorite song you do or love to drive the same car or whatever that happens to be. And, and once we kind of get that, we're just, you know, all doing the best we can, you know, <laughs> to try to raise our families and do uh, whatever we're doing, and we realize how much we have in common, then hopefully that can open dialogue to, and, and I want to learn just from, a, you know, there are people who, you know, obviously we disagree maybe on certain issues, whether it's politics, whatever it happens to be, but I think trying to just understand it from a, you know, they grew up under certain circumstances, which, and met certain people or had certain experiences which shaped how they see the world. And to understand that, I think, is extremely powerful as opposed to just, you know, dismissing uh, points of view that we don't really understand where they came from. And um, I think uh, we just need to do a better job of that. Hopefully we can do a better job of teaching our kids to engage in those kind of conversations at a younger age where it's about learning and not about judging. And right. uh, so... Scott, let me ask you. Let me ask you about uh, as we kind of wind down here uh, about history as a as a as a classics guy. Um, <laughs> exactly. Years ago, I, I read a book by a gentleman named Jeremy Rifkin called Time Wars, and in it, he made an observation. And this was at the advent of the digital watch, and I'm old enough to remember. You know, it was the red LED, and his observation was that the analog, you can see the past, you can see the future. But when we look at our digital watches right now, it's always now, now, now. And I'm wondering from your perspective as, as a person who, who, who studied this and, and the place of history, and we're all parents, uh, Leo and I are grandparents, and for me, legacy and significance is a, is a huge thing. I'm just at that phase of my life. So history matters. The lessons of history matter. I don't know. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's more important now than ever um, because, and, and I'm, I'm actually looking uh, at a bookshelf uh, just across the way here. There's a book by, um, I think it's by Seymour Hirsch. It's called Cultural Literacy. And it's basically about all the things that are part of common knowledge, the things that we should know. And again, thinking back to three networks uh, growing up, you know, I've got peers that I can, you know, be having a beer with or uh, be on the phone with, and we can reminisce about the cartoons that we watched on Saturday morning. Well, you know what? My kids don't watch cartoons on Saturday morning. What do they do? They watch YouTube, right? And to them, there's going to be no sense of shared experience with their peers mm -hmm. as they move forward because they're all watching whatever YouTuber is appropriate. And there may be, you know, the, the superstar YouTuber that everybody knows about, but everybody's got their own set of programming. And it goes, it goes to adults too. I mean, when you think that the last episode of MASH had 106 million people watching it, you'll never in a million years get another show like that happening in the media landscape today. So when, when, when you couple that with, uh, you know, all of the trials and tribulations we've just been talking about, that there's no fundamental appreciation for the past. And the past is really where all the lessons are. There's people that have made these mistakes time and again. There's patterns that you can pick out over the course of history, and you can determine where we are as a so society today with respect to those kinds of patterns. Right? It, it works with the market, it works with societies, it works with religions, I mean, all kinds of things. And I think the more we can focus on the true fundamental human lessons 
that are common to us all and, and share those in a, in a communal way, I think the better off we're going to be because the, 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 the media consumption landscape is not allowing that to happen today. And the focus, like it or not, has to be on, uh, on, on books, on, on the things we can still put our hands on that, that we can point to that are literally uh, printed in black and white, um, that are truths or that are experiences that happened before that can inform us today and tomorrow. So, Scott, I know that um, you're working on um, something that um, we'd love to maybe hear a little more about that absolutely um, touches on that very point about the value of history, the fact that we find ourselves as a society constantly having to relearn (laughs) some of the same lessons. Um, Is there a particular lesson that you hope that you can bring forward in your book that if you could imagine this is one lesson that I would really, really hope that we don't have to continue to relearn, that this is something that somehow can be embedded uh, into the fabric of our society generationally that um, you would find particularly powerful. Oh, there are so many. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I know. Um, so tentatively, the book is called What's Past is Prologue, um, Timeless Business Wisdom from uh, poets, philosophers, and authors of the past. Um, and and the, the title itself, What's Past is Prologue, that's a line out of Shakespeare. Uh, and, and it's also, um, interestingly, carved in a sculpture outside of the National Archives in Washington, D.C. My senior thesis as an undergraduate was about classical architecture and sculpture in the Federal Triangle in Washington. So much inspiration there that the founding fathers and uh, and, and, uh, and, and the architects of that city uh, had, and they realized that there was so much wisdom uh, throughout the ages. So um, in, in terms of some of the, um, the lessons that we, um, that, that we can take from the past, um, where to begin? Um, I think one of the, one of the most important ones, and we've, we've touched on it here throughout without really naming it, is the notion of empathy. Mm-hmm. Um, what we call it, you know, walk a mile in my shoes or, you know, uh, whatever you happen to, to call it. And I think it, it's stated best by Cicero, who 2,000 years ago said, if you wish to persuade me, you must think my thoughts feel my feelings, and speak my words. That right there in three simple lines encapsulates everything we've just been talking about in terms of understanding, in terms of seeking the truth, in terms of uh, de-escalating some of the anger out there. Think my thoughts, feel my feelings, uh, speak my words. Well, Scott, I'll tell you what, um, very much look forward to that book. And in addition to obviously your referencing Shakespeare and Cicero, for those of the people who are listening to this podcast, um, don't necessarily see that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle um, is, <laughs> is noted in terms of, uh, you know, uh, you know, right behind you in terms of uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, and uh, what we can learn, I'm sure, from uh, a lot of those books as well. But uh, anyway, I just want to tell you how pleased um, we are uh, that you joined us today to talk about some things that I think are really important about us and about community. And if you could uh, just finally leave our listeners with um you know, some ways that they can um, engage you online and learn more about your work. Uh, that'd be terrific. Sure. Uh, I am Scott Monty on all of the social networks, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, and you can find me at scottmonty.com. All right. And the full Monty podcast is, uh, <laughs> is definitely worth, is worth listening to. I, I didn't want to, want to put out a competing link there. But no, no, no. It's awesome. It's that's, awesome. I'm a big fan. Five minutes, uh, five minutes a week. You know, I try to do it in the, the morning Paul Harvey style where, you know, he just, he grabbed it for five minutes and that's all he had to commit. No, you do it. You do it well. I'm a, I'm a huge fan. So the full Monty. I like it.
All right. Hey, well, you all have a great day. Thank you so much. And thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks, Scott. My pleasure. To learn more about our show and what we do to submit questions to us and to subscribe to What Anyone Can Do podcast, please visit our website, whatanyonecando.com. What Anyone Can Do podcast is hosted by Leo Batari and me, Randy Cantrell. Music provided by Kevin McLeod is Vibe Ace, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 license. Thanks for watching or listening. We hope you'll share the podcast.